Hey, welcome CNBC family uh, to another Wednesday night recharge. Glad you have joined us once again. Uh, it has been a blessed day, an awesome day, and we give God thanks. Here we are. We've made it to uh, this point in the day where we spend time together in God's Word. And so, as we typically do, uh, we share some things with you that are happening with regard to our church family. Uh, then we spend some time in prayer, and then we get into the Word of God. So again, thank you for joining us. I'm Pastor Gary N. Renfro, pastor of the Corinth Missionary Baptist Church, and uh, we're glad to have you once again on tonight. So uh, last Sunday, uh, we celebrated with the um, Greater Union Church family with Pastor Ricky Williams and his wife, Sister Linda Williams, and their 32nd anniversary. And I just want to say thank you to the Corinth family for the way you showed up on that Sunday. We did not have services at our church because we joined in with them to worship and celebrate with them. And uh, our, I want to thank again our young folk, man. They, they blessed my heart. I know they blessed our hearts. Uh, the, the youth choir, Chosen Generation, uh, under the leadership of Brother uh, Tyrone, Minister Tyrone, he, uh, he blessed us with those kids. Uh, thank God for Sister Kiska, all of our parents and other youth workers and leaders uh, who helped to be sure that they were there. And like I said, they did an awesome job. So again, a big awesome thank you. Uh, for that. Now, this coming Sunday, we will celebrate with our own choir, our CNBC Music Ministry, uh, our, our band, uh, all of our choir members, the different choirs we have. We're just going to celebrate them on this coming Sunday. And so we're grateful to have the father of our minister of music, Brother Charles Hunter. His dad is going to be delivering the message uh, for us on this coming Sunday. So I'm looking forward to that. So we'll be back at Corinth. 10.30 worship, uh, 9 o'clock Sunday school. So let's come together for, for that. And I think, y'all, that's it for, uh, for now. Uh, we want to spend some time in prayer. So let's be mindful of all of those cares and concerns affecting our church family, uh, affecting those that we're connected with, our friends, our neighbors, our loved ones. Uh, so much is going on. We had some, uh, uh, some deaths in our church family. Matter of fact, uh, Pastor Ricky Williams, uh, they had a death in their church family. So we just want to lift up all families that are going through and dealing with sorrow uh, and trying to navigate, uh, navigate that. So uh, let's spend some time in prayer for all uh, that is affecting and afflicting uh, and, and disturbing us on this day, knowing that our God is, is more than capable. He is he is able, so let's turn it all over to him. Father God, in the precious, uh, the awesome, the mighty, the marvelous name of your son, Jesus the Christ, we pause now to just pray and say thank you. Thank you, Lord God, uh, that you gave us another day. You brought us to this point in the day. Here we are together uh, through the benefit of technology to spend time in your word. And God, we are alive. Uh, we, we have the activities of our limbs. We're in our right mind. And for that, we want to say thank you. We thank you for the blessings that you keep showering upon us. Your faithfulness continues to, to, to show and demonstrate your love for us. I say thank you, Lord God. I pray, Master, for each and every family uh, of our church, each and every connection that is to our families in our church. Those who watch this video may not even be a part of our church, uh, but, but somehow they found us on YouTube, and God, they continue uh, to tune in and check us out. And I pray, Lord God, and I, I believe that your word never returns to you void. So if we keep sharing and giving your word, God, you're using it for your kingdom purpose way far beyond uh, what's happening at Corinth. And so we say thank you for that opportunity, for that privilege, Lord God, to be able uh, to do that. I lift up, God, each and every person that will be watching this. I lift up our families. I lift up every concern that they may have, especially those, God, who are under the shadow of bereavement. Uh, they're dealing with loss. Uh, death uh, is, has been conquered. But until Jesus comes again, we will have to deal with death. We'll have to deal with death. The sorrow that it brings, the hurt that it uh, brings, the trouble that it brings, the sleepless nights that it brings, we will still have to deal with that. But Father God, we don't have to if we turn it over to you. You said in your word, cast all of our cares. Cast all of our cares upon you because you care for us. 
And so that's exactly what we do, is that we put it all in your hands. We turn it all over to you. We thank you, Father, for uh, the provisions that you give us, the protection that you give us. We thank you uh, for your hand in our lives. Now, Father, we spend time in your word. So I'm praying and asking that you would guide us by your spirit as we take a look at your word. And the more we look at your word and allow your word to look at us, we get to grow. We get to be better, stronger. Use us, Father, for your glory and for your benefit. So these things we ask now in the precious and awesome, the mighty and marvelous name of your son, Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, folks, here we are again back in the book of James, uh, and we have moved now to James chapter 3. So you'll get your Bibles to James chapter 3, and uh, we have the uh, Bible study notes that we put out, and so those are available uh, to you through email. If we don't have your email, reach out to us at cnbcaustin.org, and we'll get your email, then we're able to send these out to you when we send them out to everybody else. So uh, get us your email and then uh, again we failed to mention it probably the last couple of times but if you're being blessed by what you are receiving uh, through the benefit of uh, these these YouTube recordings uh, and you want to be a blessing to our church family then uh, again through the cnbcaustin.org uh, website there's a way that you can uh, bless and give and, and sow a seed into this ministry so that we keep doing what we are doing. All right. James chapter 3. So, um, in chapter 3 um, of this letter or epistle uh, to the Jewish believers that, that he's writing to, uh, this letter bears his name, uh, we've already talked about two characteristics of the mature Christian. He said to us early on that this, this Bible study, this book study in James, is, is coinciding with what we've been dealing with all year, and that is growth and, 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 and being mature and, and being better believers and Christians and servants. Uh, but sometimes we have to grow in areas, and so we're looking at James as a part of that. And so he says two characteristics that we've already dealt with with regard to being a mature Christian is that he or she is patient in trouble. That was chapter one, that you're patient in trouble. The other characteristic of someone who is mature or a maturing believer is that uh, he or she practices the truth. And that's where we were uh, finishing up last week in chapter 2, practicing, we practice the truth. So if we are believers and we say we have faith in Christ, uh, then that faith ought to cause us to, to do something. That faith ought to cause us to act especially when we see people in, in need. So uh, um, a faith that does not act, according to James, is a dead faith, right? A dead faith. So those are two characteristics. One, uh, patient in trouble. Two, practices the truth. And then now three, in this section, this chapter, we start to talk about uh, a mature believer who has power over their tongue. Yeah, power over their tongue tongue. <laughs> a believer who does not bridle his or her tongue or control their tongue can cause a lot of damage and prove that they are not truly uh, religious. And maybe I, I could change that word. Um, nothing wrong with religious, but sometimes religious can have a negative connotation in that we just do it to be doing something. But no, it's deeper than that. We have a relationship uh, uh, with Christ and so it's deeper than that but it shows that we belong to him we belong to him so the power of speech is one of the greatest powers that was given to us by God James wants to impress upon us the importance of controlled speech and then the consequences of our words the importance of controlled speech and the consequences of our words our words are like seeds and they will grow. Remember, Jesus used that analogy when he talked about the word uh, and, and where it's scattered. It's like seed. Our words are like seed, and it will grow. The question is, what type of fruit will that seed bear? What are we casting, and what are we getting back? So James gives several pictures 
to, to compare the tongue to. And so we're going to start off tonight by looking at the bit and rudder. Bit, B-I-T, and rudder. And that's coming from James chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. So reading from the New Revised Standard Version, chapter 3, verse 1 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Oh, wow. <laughs> for all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the wheel of the pilot directs. Verses 1 through 4 uh, of James chapter 3. So two, two things he points out, the bridle that goes in the horse's mouth, the rudder that guides the ship. But he starts with caution, those who teach should be aware that they face a stricter judgment. Not many of you, let not many of you become teachers. Hmm. When we are unprepared to teach a lesson and we say the wrong thing or we give the wrong interpretation of a passage, it can have a negative effect on the hearers. And God will hold that teacher accountable. So in other words, James is trying to say, don't be so careless with the word of God, especially the word of God that is coming from our mouths when we, when we are in a position of power or authority because we are teaching. If the teacher lives a life that does not line up with what they teach, and it has a negative effect on the hearer or the observer, God will hold that teacher accountable. And again, according to James, that, he, that he'll do that with a stricter, uh, a, a, a stricter judgment because we again are in places of authority with things that are coming from our mouths and then our lives don't match what's coming out of our mouth. So God is saying, be careful if you want the, 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 the place and be in a place of a teacher and hold that, that, that position. Uh, and, and, and it doesn't just mean being a Sunday school teacher, uh, being a Bible study teacher. You are a teacher when you stand before young folk and you're leading them as, as a youth director. You are a teacher when you stand before individuals uh, and, and you're giving guidance when it comes to uh, serving in, in the worship service, when it comes to teaching songs that are going to be sung in the worship service. All of those are examples of, of teaching where things are coming from your mouth and instruction, right? And, and if we do it haphazardly, uh, or we do it in such a way that does not honor God, then uh, God will judge. We learned that in chapter 2. God will judge every word that comes from our mouth, everything that we do. And, and James here says he will hold us in those positions. He will hold us to a stricter judgment. So teachers, let's practice what we teach. James compared the tongue to two items uh, that are small but yet exercise great power, just like the tongue. One is the bit, a small, metal, uh, small piece of metal, which is part of a bridle, and it's placed in the horse's mouth, and it, ena it enables the rider to control the large horse. The second is a rudder, which is a small part of a ship, which allows the pilot to steer a huge ship. Both bit and rudder must overcome contrary forces. The bit must overcome the wild nature of the horse, and the rudder must go against the winds and currents trying to push the ship off course. So James gives these two small items, but he's saying to us, look at the kind of power that these small items have over large things. So the bit, small item, but it can control a huge horse. Think of uh, these large horses uh, stallions and and I'm thinking of my mind I can't call them but they're the horses horses that are used in the beer commercial the Budweiser commercial those are huge horses right but those horses even those horses are controlled by that small bit that's in its uh, in its mouth and then the ship these huge ships that are controlled by a small rudder 
um, they, 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 they've got to overcome. They've got to overcome opposing uh, forces. Uh, this just means that we need to put the control of our tongue in the hand of a supernatural force. I say the Holy Spirit needs to give us guidance. Guide what we say because the power of life and death are in the tongue, according to the, uh, the writer of Proverbs. The power of life and death are in the tongue. So I, I, would, I would encourage us uh, to seek the help of God's Spirit to give us guidance, to help control us uh, in our anger, in our emotions, so that we don't say things with our mouths uh, that come out and those things we cannot take back and those things destroy because that's not who we want to be as, as believers of Jesus Christ. The bit and rudder also have the power to give direction. So never underestimate the guidance that comes from the words uh, you speak or do not speak. So con consider that the bit and the rudder, both of those are used to give direction. So we need to make sure that we un don't underestimate what comes out of our mouths or possibly what we don't say and something still occurs because we chose not to say anything. Okay, So the bit and the rudder were two uh, things that he used to compare the tongue to. And then next, the fire and animal. The fire and animal. So those are verses 5 through 8. So beginning at verse 5. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of uh, as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and it is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue. A restless evil full of deadly poison. <laughs> wow. No one can tame the tongue. So he says the, the tongue is like fire or an animal. We have all heard of forest fires uh, that have started from a small spark. Just did a quick Google search because I, I thought about the fires uh, that we had not so long ago in uh, here in the state of Texas burning in West Texas and then the, the fires uh, that are always burning in California. Currently there are 71 large wildfires burning as of today. They burned over 2.2 uh, million acres. And a lot of these fires were caused by something small. Cigarette butt, the spark from uh, the exhaust pipe of a vehicle, um, anything, just small sparks that start the, the, the blaze to going. The point James is making with his analogy is that the tongue can cause damage just like a wildfire when it starts spreading gossip and lies. Our words can start fires. And like fire, our words can burn and hurt. The Lord Jesus had to put up with hurtful words from his critics. They called him a wine, a wine bibber because he was always spending time dining with those uh, that were not considered um, people that you should dine with, right? He was spending time with them so that he could share with them the gospel message. But the religious right of that day uh, saw that as somebody who just liked to hang around with folks who liked to drink. They said he was in collaboration with Satan because he was able to cast out demons. So when he was casting out demons, they said that, well, you're in collaboration with Beelzebub, you know. And so Christ is like, that doesn't make sense. Why would I, if I'm in collaboration with Beelzebub, cast out demons? I mean, Beelzebub is, is, is leader, led, uh, head of demons, and, and I'm casting out demons. That doesn't make sense. But again, casting those words... Uh, demeaning who he is, even while he was dying on the cross, they still threw insults and taunts while he was hanging on the cross. And so again, with these words, using these words, inflamed words uh, to hurt and cause damage, 
uh, and destruction. Not only is the tongue like a fire, but James said it is also like a dangerous animal. Some animals are wild and unruly, while other animals can be uh, poisonous. The tongue can be the same if it is not kept in check. It can be like a wild animal that is untamed and can be very dangerous, or it can be like a poison snake that strikes quickly and ingests its victim with deadly venom. We would not allow a lion to sit in service with us or have a rattlesnake let loose in the sanctuary and we should not want anyone with loose lips doing damage to the body of Christ. That's how the tongue is according to, to James. It can be like a wild unruly animal tearing up everything. I just thought in my mind a bull in a china shop. R unruly animal destroying up everything. A uh, poisonous snake injecting its venom into the, 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 the minds of individuals and then it causes it causes trouble in the in the church. These are things that he says are are are, are, are what the tongue is used for uh, and used by humans who don't have a good enough relationship with Christ to allow his Holy Spirit to take control. He already said in the text, um, we can't control it. None of us can control it. it. Sets everything on fire. By hell, for every species a bird can be tamed, but no one, uh, every species of bird or, or, or animal can be tamed, but no one can tame the tongue. So even humans have tried to tame and have tamed uh, a, a lot of wild animals. But no one, no human has been able to tame the tongue. If we're able to do it, it's only because uh, the power of Christ is working within us. And that's really what we, what we need. So we've had the bit and the rudder. We've had the fire and the animal. And now lastly, the fountain and the tree. Here it is. And those verses finish out this section, verses 9 through 12. And it reads, With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. Again, he's talking about the tongue. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. The problem with some believers is that they think it's okay to bless God with their tongue and praise and worship, but with the same tongue, curse their fellow brother or sister who may, who've been made in the image of God. So to speak against them, to, to call them out of their name, and to actually, you know, use words, curse words uh, against them. And that person has been made in the very image of God. We may not like what they do. We may not like what they say, but still they're made in the very image of God. And God sent his only begotten son, not just for us, but he sent him for them too. And though they may reject him now, at some point, maybe someday, they, he or she may not, right? So to put our mouths on them and, 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 and yet we, we want to bless God, we want to bless him. Uh, James is saying, no, that, that, that doesn't mesh, that doesn't fit. We can't do that. We can't praise him and, and curse others uh, at the same time. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brother, these things ought not to be so. Well, he's saying here water. You know, water is life. It's, it's life-giving. So when he's talking about uh, uh, from this spring pouring forth uh, fresh water or brackish water, that's bitter water. If we understand water to give life and that, that it, it, when it flows, it, it's, it's a life-flowing, life-giving thing, then that's what our mouths ought to be. From our mouths should flow life. The words of a man's mouth are as deep waters. The wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. This comes from the prophet. I'm sorry, this comes from Proverbs 18 and 4. Bitter 
uh, and fresh water cannot come from the same fountain. Water is a precious gift of refreshment for the wee weary traveler. The thirsty child playing in the, the, the schoolyard or the hard worker making his or her living in the heat of the day. So must our tongue be to the person who is struggling just to get to worship on Sunday or the person who's being verbally beaten down at work. They need a kind word that is like refreshing water. That's what our words are to be, like refreshing water. He says the tongue can also be like a tree. A tree helps to hold down the soil, provide shade from the heat, and some trees bear fruit. Our words can help to shelter a person from the storms of life or encourage them in their struggles. The prophet Isaiah writes, The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. So as I pay attention, as I listen in, then I'm able to share, speak a word that, bling, that, that brings blessing, uh, that offers refreshing uh, to those who, who, who are struggling, who are having a hard time. That's what our tongues ought to be about. And so like a tree, he said, uh, holding soil together, the roots of a tree, helping to hold soil together. Like a tree providing shade. That's what our tongues ought to be. It ought to be a place to, to give shade and, and protection, not to bring harm and destruction. Our tongues ought to help bear, uh, bear fruit. Bear fruit. So just as we expect a, frick, a fig tree to produce figs or an olive tree to produce olives, the Lord expects his children to have tongues which produce fruit that is consistent with who they are in him. So oftentimes, will people, people will hear us really before they see us do a lot of stuff. And so what we say should line up with who we are uh, in him. And that's all James is trying to say. We've got to control uh, that little member of our bodies. Taming the tongue is what you and I as, uh, as believers have to endeavor to do. And we do that by turning it over to him. Turning it over, turning this tongue over to him. God guide what I say, guard my heart and my mind so that it, it, it protects, it filters what I, what I say because I want the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart to be acceptable in your sight. And that's our goal. Let's bow. Father, we bless you again and we say thank you for this opportunity to spend uh, this time in your word and again using your word, God, which will never turn void. So I know that this, your word, will go forth. Somebody's heard it. They've received it, Father. And God, you're going to take that word, and it's going to bring about a change. It's going to convict. It's going to challenge them, Lord God. It's going to bring about a change. And that's all we need. That's, that's what we're asking. Your word does that through the power of your Holy Spirit. And so we thank you for this, your word. I thank you for those who have seen this uh, recording and use it, God, to better uh, their lives. Bless and keep, Father God, your people as only you can. This we pray and ask in the wonderful name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. God bless. Amen.